it was Police Constable Bryant who was under the influence of drink. Bryant was very excited and out of temper. This is what my ancestor Griffith Charles Davis, the brother of my three times great-grandfather, argued at the Sandilo Petty Sessions. Griffith was being charged with being drunk and disorderly by PC Alfred Bryant, but having the spotlight turned back on him and his sobriety on the night of the incident probably was not how PC Bryant was expecting the case to play out. Griffith's case actually provides some interesting insight into Welsh village life in the late 19th century and the role of those communities in making decisions about how to carry out conflict resolution in ways that look beyond policing and punishment. Hey everybody, I hope you're having a lovely day today. Welcome to Genial Cymru. My name is Dai, and here we talk about genealogy and Welsh history. If you're interested in any of that, make sure to hit the subscribe button. A number of people from the Welsh village of Llandabia gathered in a courtroom at the Llandilo Petty Sessions on a cold Saturday afternoon, December 29, 1888. They stood there before Mr. J. Peel and J. C. Thomas to argue the case of drunkenness and disorderliness of my ancestor Griffith Charles Davis. On one side stood Police Constable Alfred Bryant and William Phillips, the Chief Constable of Carmarthenshire County. On the other side stood Griffith Charles Davis, a Mason, the solicitor T.G. Williams, and all of the witnesses, Griffith's brother John Davis, Griffith's buddy Morgan Davis Collier, Mr. and Miss Morris, the owners of the Red Lion Pub, Sarah Evans, a pub patron, and the Reverend David Davis, vicar of Sandbia. P.C. Bryant's argument was this. Griffith was out wandering the street drunk, and when he saw the police constable, he ran into the pub. When P.C. Bryant entered the pub, Griffith pulled him out and verbally harassed him. P.C. Bryant told Griffith to go home or be arrested, but Griffith went to the vicar. After going to see the vicar, he came back and continued to harass the police constable. Griffith and his witnesses told a very different story. The vicar, David Davis, said that Griffith came to see him and was ruffled and excited, but he was sober. Reverend Davis also said that Griffith wasn't known to be growing a troublesome character in the village. Mr. Morris, the owner of the pub, didn't actually ask P.C. Bryant to turn Griffith out. He also said that P.C. Bryant seemed to be in a sharp temper because of a fight he was in earlier that evening. Griffith, his brother, and his buddy all told the same story. They were standing in the pub having a pint. P.C. Bryant came in, grabbed Griffith by the collar, and dragged him out of the pub. They said that the police constable had been in a fight earlier that evening, he was tripped, fell, and then seemed to be drunk. In the end, P.C. Bryant wasn't able to prove that Griffith was drunk that night. However, they didn't believe that P.C. Bryant was drunk himself. But afterwards, the case was picked up in the newspapers throughout South Wales and titled, Drunkenness, a serious charge against a police constable. This article left me with a couple questions. The first one was why did so many witnesses show up for Griffith? And I think the answer to this question can tell us something about how small Welsh communities at this time operated. According to legal historian Richard Ireland, a number of factors created tensions between police forces and rural communities in 19th century Wales. These factors included language, culture, religion, and political affiliation, but at the core they were issues of community membership. Community membership was a general concern for people in 19th century Britain. According to historian Keith Snell, people at this time still had strong xenophobic attitudes towards people even from the next parish over. 
If we look at the backgrounds of PC Bryant and Chief Constable Phillips, you soon see how social differences and the xenophobic roots of parish life might have marked them as outsiders in the community. So for the community members that showed up for Griffith, there were people from farming, laboring, and tradesperson backgrounds. They primarily spoke Welsh, although the majority of them were bilingual, and they all lived in the village for their whole lives, or for at least 10 years. His witnesses like the Morrises and the Reverend Davis were people who ran important community institutions, the church and the pub. These are people who see each other on a daily basis and had to deal with the everyday consequences of severed community ties. Chief Constable Phillips was a bilingual English and Welsh speaker. The rest of his family only spoke English, so in his everyday life in his household, he probably only spoke English as well. He was from Abergwili, outside of Camarthen town, and he didn't even live in Llandabia. He lived in Llandilo since about 1866. He also held an important government position and was of the elite social class. PC Bryant was even more socially different. He was a monolingual English speaker, and he was born in Rolvenden, Kent, England, to two parents who were also born in Kent. He spent his youth living in southeast England, and in his later years he moved around a lot. He had no familial connections to Wales at all. And while he was a police constable in Llandbia, he didn't live there. He lived in Ammonford, which was an adjacent town to Llandbia. He didn't stay long in the area either, and we don't find him there on the 1881 census before this case, or in the 1891 census after this case, when he'd already left to Llanesli. PC Bryant wouldn't have been able to converse with the largely monolingual Welsh-speaking community that he held power over, and Phillips was so socially distant in terms of social and economic class that he probably would never encounter them to talk to in the first place. The social distance between these two groups of people likely played a role in how this case played out. Why so many people showed up for Griffith and why he was found to be not guilty of being drunk and disorderly. In this case, the community members were able to come together and exert their power in a really unexpected way. And I think that this is one of the most interesting stories here. It's not whether or not Griffith had been drunk and disruptive that night. I think he was because there's more evidence beyond this event that he didn't really have a healthy relationship with alcohol. But this is a story of community and how people come together to address conflict. Drunk or not, he did disrupt these people's lives. If he was causing a scene outside the pub, that disrupted the lives of the pub owners. He went to the church to go bother the vicar late at night. And most importantly, he took them away from their other duties that Saturday morning. But his witnesses, the community members, collectively decided that punishment wasn't an appropriate response to that conflict. So what did they decide on? How did they resolve this conflict, and how could they have remained in healthy relationship with each other? There are lots of different options across societies for dealing with conflict. What a lot of the people probably watching these videos are most familiar with is carcerality. Carcerality is related to the word incarcerated. According to criminologist and justice scholar Ritchie and Martinson, carcerality refers to the ideologies, economic policies, and legal initiatives associated with using punishment as a means to deal with conflict in society. So think punishment, throwing people in prison to forget about them, disposing of people, removing and excluding them from society, and in places with a private prison system, making money off of them or making them do unpaid labor. Carcerality is about harming people who we perceive as having harmed others. 
And that's generally how problems in Euro-American societies are dealt with. To go back to Griffith's case, the punishment probably wouldn't have been prison. It probably would have been a fine, as happened later that year, but it still would have fallen within this carceral mindset. Whatever it would have been, again, the community decided it was not appropriate. What might have been closer to what happened, though we can't be for sure, is probably that he was held accountable in the community. I've learned a lot about accountability, mostly from people like author, artist, and activist Sonia Renee Taylor. She says that accountability can only happen in community. You can't hold people accountable when you're not in community with them. You can certainly punish them, but not hold them accountable. For Taylor, there's two main steps to accountability for the person who caused harm acknowledging the harm done, and then making a plan for how to address the harm and minimize any future harm. She also highlights the amount of labor that is often put on the person who has been harmed. They have to explain how they were harmed. They often have to do so carefully to get around the person's shame and defensiveness responses. And especially today and in online communities, they have to deal with the potential fallout from addressing the harm. But sometimes, and in the case of Griffith, our community members choose to take on that work. So, how might Griffith have kept in a healthy relationship with his community members by being held accountable? How could he have returned their favors and support? And how could he have repaid the work that they did in supporting him? Maybe for the Reverend David Davis, it looked like cleaning the church. Maybe for the pub owners, it looked like helping with deliveries, moving boxes, and organizing storage. Griffith was a mason, so maybe he did some work fixing up the stone walls in the pub or at the church. Or maybe it wasn't as simple as doing work for them. Maybe, at some point later in the future, they called on him to do something for them, similarly to how he called on them to support him. These are all possibilities, but the overall point that I want you to take away is that communities at any size have the power to choose how conflict gets resolved, and there are really powerful ways that we can choose to do so in a way that doesn't rely on a carceral system of punishment and disposing of people, throwing them out of the community. And it's really important that we be creative and start to make those new choices. If you'd like to see more genealogy or Welsh history videos, please make sure to hit the subscribe button. If you'd like to support this channel or get access to exclusive content, check out the Patreon and join the newsletter. You can also follow us on most platforms just by searching Genial Cymru.